you find um, here in the north, it's mainly white growing areas. And this is because in the north, we have much cooler temperatures in the night. We have beautiful warm days, but in the night, because this region is a little bit higher, the altitude, and in the night, we get cold winds from the north. And these cold winds are responsible that we have a really beautiful and shiny, fresh acidity. So this is perfect for white wine growing. You get a really expressive fruit because of this day and night temperature difference. And you have a really beautiful, fresh acidity. And the two main white varieties here in this region are Grüner Veltlina. Grüner Veltlina is the most important white variety in Austria. And of course, Riesling is also very important. And then we have a third wine, it's not a variety that is really important in the north of Austria, that is Gemischter Satz. And these three varieties, I will explain a little bit more in deep why it's so special in Austria. So I'm back. <laughs> I hope the, the connection is good and that you understand me. And if there are any questions about the region itself and the differences, I think now would be a good moment to ask. No questions via the chat or something? Okay. Ingrid, okay. I think everyone is excited to hear about Gemischter Satz. It's, it's, a, it's a very strange word for Spanish speakers. And so I think the history and some details behind Gemischter Satz would be very interesting I will, to hear. I will, I will tell you, but first, I think I will tell a little bit about Grüner Veltliner and Riesling, and then we go to Gemischter Satz. Perfect. So I will explain all three, all three of them, because they are quite important. Uh, I see we do have a question in, in the chat. Uh, Joseph is asking, Joseph Ruiz is asking about uh, if climate change is having any impact on the acidity uh, in the grapes. So till now, till now, it's quite interesting because when we watch total temperature, sunlight, days, things like this, also water that we have, we don't see a change yet. Also not concerning ripeness. Here in Europe, there's the discussion, should we plant the north side of the slopes in the future, or should we plant um, varieties that grow more in the south in the future? But we don't see that yet, to be honest. But what we see concerning climate change is that the weather conditions becoming more and more extreme. For example, if we have in total 600 milliliters rainfall per year, in former times, this rain was coming per a per, was raining for one day or two, then two weeks sunshine, then a little bit rain again. And now we see more thunderstorms where within a short time, 
a lot of rain is coming and then it's dry for another three to four weeks. So these conditions are getting more extreme, but we don't see a change concerning ripeness or acidity. And I think one of our most important challenges for the future will be to work in the vineyards really good and to work really good with the soil. So if we have thunderstorms and a lot of rain is coming, that we don't have erosion. And on the other side, that we preserve our soil in dry periods from evaporation. So we work with a lot of coarse manure, we work with green crop, we work with compost in order to keep our soil alive, that we have many microorganisms, worms, animals that make a quite loose, fluffy soil. So if a lot of rain is coming, the water goes into the soil and not runs away. And on the other side, in dry periods, we try to cover the soil with uh, mud, green crop or straw in order to prevent evaporation. And this is the reason why we work certified organic. I think that the organic production and the organic work helps our vineyards to overcome these more extreme weather conditions that we see in the last 10, 15 years. Well, now let's talk about our Austrian grape varieties. So what you see now in the picture is Grüner Weltliner. This is a photo that I took from um, a vineyard that I have where I'm really proud of because the vineyard is uh, more than 60 years old. And I love these old vineyards because you get really concentrated aromas. You have not that much yield, of course, but the grapes are so tasty and so delicious. And the name Grüner Weltliner, Grüner means green. But you see, it's nice to show a picture of Grüner Weltliner because you see when the grapes are ripe, um, they have a beautiful yellow color. So they have nothing to do with green grapes or unripe grapes or whatever. And it's a quite big grape that has a lot of taste in the skin. And depending on the soil type and harvest time, um, Grüner Weltliner is a variety that has amazing wines from a fresh fruity category to really powerful and beautiful wines in the reserve category. So words about minerality and structure. And Grüner Weltliner can range, can have a really broad range of flavors and a broad range of characters. And I think Grüner Weltliner is a variety that can express the soil where it grows wonderful. And when you think about Grüner Weltliner, it's a variety that can have these really fresh citric aromas where you find hints of grapefruit, hints of lemon, green apple, a nice savory acidity. So wines that are perfect, for example, with seafood, with oysters, with lobster, or if I think about your fusion cuisine, like a ceviche, I hope I pronounce it correct. But this is a style that Grüner Weltliner can make perfect. I would say perfect. And then on the other side, you have the reserve category wine. The term reserve has nothing to do with aging in oak. In Austria, the term reserve just means keeping longer in the barrel, keeping on the full lease, harvest really late where you have a gorgeous uh, physiological ripeness, usually from the oldest vineyards. And 
if you have this reserved category wines, then you find mostly quinces, a ripe pear, a yellow apple, sometimes stone fruit. And they're really concentrated on the palate where you find a nice minerality and still a nice acidity that keeps the wine alive. And I think a big difference to the whites from France or Spain or Italy is, and this makes Austria so special for all the white wines that we have, we harvest physiological, super ripe and tasty grapes. And even if the grapes are super ripe, we have acidity and we have freshness and you can drink a bottle and you can still drink another one because the wines are usually 12, 12.5, 13 alcohol, not more. And this is beautiful. And I told you, Grüner Weltliner, depending on soil type and harvest date, can show many different styles. And the same does Riesling. And Riesling is the second most important white variety in Austria. And Austrian Riesling is so different than Riesling from Germany or Alsace, because Riesling expresses terroir and where it comes from in a way I think no other grape can do it. And Austrian Riesling is always beautiful floral. You have these white blossoms. It's always much more playing and dancing. And it's always beautiful and inviting. And I personally think every soil has another expression. And for example, when I overtook the winery, I always said, I just want to grow varieties that fit to my region and that fit to my soil. And it's very important to think about which variety you grow on which soil. And I'll show you something. Austria, um, even if it's a small country again, we have quite diverse soil types and every variety needs another soil. And Austria has two main, no, three main influences concerning soil. One is from the primary ocean. In Austria, we had an ocean, but millions of years ago. And we always had in my region a quite important river, the river Danube, the Donau. Uh, and the Danube has now a completely different, how do you say, river flow, but it was also in my region. And then, of course, alluvial soil that came by wind. And we have conglomerate soils. These soils are influenced by the former Danube the Donau, the river, um, and it's just pure stones. And on that kind of soil, we grow Riesling mainly because this is gorgeous for Riesling. Riesling needs to suffer a little bit. And here you see, for example, a soil that has a lot of chalk in it, mal lime and primary rocks. This is also a kind of soil where we would grow Grüner Weltliner, the single vineyards, because you get a lot of minerality from this kind of chalky soils. And then we have soils that are more influenced by Lus and sand. Lus is a fine, how do you say, kind of sand that came with the winds from Asia. And over a million of years, these banks with this kind of yellow soil, that is called less, developed. And this is perfect for a fresh fruity Grüner Weltliner, because from this soil, you always get a really beautiful, shiny, shiny fruit. Wonderful. And then something really beautiful and interesting. This is a seashell rock. Um, that we got from the former ocean that we had in Austria. These are quite chalky stones. 
So the soil has a lot of chalk in it. And this produces really wonderful wines with a lot of minerality. They are never fat, they are never too alcoholic. They are always shining. And from this kind of soil, we make also single vineyard wines. And we also have some gemischte Satz on this kind of soil. And I will tell you a little bit about gemischte Satz. I was telling you now about the two most important white varieties, Grüner Veltliner and Riesling. And I told you we have a third wine in Austria, also white, that is really important. But it's not real a variety. Gemischte Satz is something special. And I will tell you in one minute what Gemischte Satz is. I'll show you a picture. This is Gemischter Satz. So Gemischter Satz is a field blend. So that means in the vineyard, it's not just one variety planted. There are many, many, many different varieties planted together at the same time in the same vineyard. And we harvest together and we ferment together. They're completely randomly mixed planted. And the photo you see is a typical harvest bucket. And the varieties that look pink or red are also white varieties. It's just a little bit more colored skin, but it's just white wine. It's varieties like Rote Veltliner or Frü Rote Veltliner. And Gemischter Satz is something really super, super, super traditional. And it's really special for Austria. In former times, 50 or 100 years ago, uh, nearly all vineyards in Austria were Gemischter Satz vineyards. It's actually the most traditional way of planting grapes in Austria. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Gemischter Satz. This is Gemischter Satz. And Gemischter Satz, like I said, is a field blend. And it's super, super traditional. So in former times in Austria, everybody had Gemischter Satz. And it sounds a little bit strange to have so many different varieties at the same time in the same vineyard. In my Gemischtersatz, we have 17 different varieties planted. But it makes absolutely sense to plant in that way. And the reason why people planted in that way is you have to imagine in former time, Wineries haven't had five or 10 or 15 different wines in the range. They usually had a house wine white and the house wine red. And for the people, it was really important that the wines became really good every year, no matter if it was a cold, rainy vintage or a hot and a dry vintage. And in Gemischter Satz, they always had the guarantee that the wine became really, really good, no matter how the vintage was. And the reason why it is like that is some varieties bring the acidity, some varieties bring the fruit, some varieties bring the minerality, some bring the structure, some varieties ripen earlier, some ripen later. The potpourri of all these varieties recycled every year in a wine that was really balanced, no matter how the vintage is. So you always find fruit, you always find acidity you always find minerality, you always find structure. And what I love, every minute we discover new aromas. So you smell to the glass and you think, oh, perhaps it's Grüner Veltliner. And then you smell again and you think, perhaps it's Riesling. Again, no, is this Müller Thurgau? And every minute other fruit impressions are coming, then they're going, others are coming, then they're going, coming, going. It's always playing, always so many things happens at the same time because 
of all these varieties that are in the Gemischtes Hatz. And this is what I like about Gemischter Satz, because Gemischter Satz is never one dimensional. Gemischter Satz is always really complex because it's happening at the same time. And for me, Gemischter Satz is a little bit like a chameleon. A chameleon can change the color if you put it on different backgrounds. And the same does the Gemischter Satz when it comes to that's from always flexible because uh, it fits to such a huge range of dishes because you have acidity, you have hints of sweetness, you have this ripe fruit aromas. On the other side, you have the freshness in the glass. So it's always so complex. It's always so plain. And I personally think it's a super restaurant-friendly wine because I don't know how it is in Peru. But in Austria, it can happen on one table. One is eating a schnitzel. Schnitzel is a traditional Austrian delicious dish. Another one is eating fish. The third one is eating pasta. And the fourth one is eating vegan salad. So as a sommelier, what do you recommend? It's so difficult. And I personally make the experience that gemischter Satz always fits, no matter what you eat except chocolate cake or something like that. But Gemischter Satz for me is always a gorgeous, gorgeous food partner because it's always playing, it's changing in the nose. It's always so interesting and it fits to a huge range of dishes. And this is what is so special about Gemischter Satz. Exactly. Ingrid, uh, a question. Uh, okay. I get this question frequently. Uh, what? What exactly is Brighton Pukdorf? Ah, uh, it's the village. It's village. Brighton Pukdorf is um, Yes, exactly. Brighton Puchdorf, I know it's a horrible word. Nobody can spell it, so don't be afraid of saying it. In the whole world, everybody is spelling it wrong, but you cannot make something wrong because nobody knows how to pronounce it. <laughs> so don't be scared of the name. But, you know, we have the, the region wines, like Grüner Weltliner Weinviertel. Then we have the Village category, village, like Brighton Puchdorf. And then we have the single vineyards. So it's a pyramid. And the Brighton Puchdorf, the village wines for me are always excellent partners for food. The single vineyards, they are on top. And these are wines that are also perfect for aging, that are really mineralic, really structured. And on the basic, the region wines, are wines that are really beautiful to drink, you know, where you open a bottle, you enjoy it, it makes fun. So this is the idea about the wines. Uh, I saw that Anthony had a question. He wrote in the chat, hi Ingrid, what happens with the rich and colored, with the no colored rich in your map? Also produce wines. I will answer the question, if you don't mind. So I showed you the map of Austria. So here is no color. And here is actually no wine growing because these regions are too high in altitude. There you have the Alps, rocky mountains, and it's too cold. The vegetation period is too short. So usually it's not possible to grow wine. Of course, there are some tiny, tiny, super, super, really super tiny parcels somewhere uh, of people who try it, if it's possible. But actually, you can say outside of the colored region, there is no wine growing in Austria. 
Yeah. Do you produce any sparkling wines? Madeleine is asking in the chat. I personally don't produce sparkling wines, but of course in Austria, there are wonderful sparkling wines from the whites because we have a CDD. And the climate is not that different from Champagne region, to be honest. I personally don't produce sparkling wine because when I overtook the winery from my parents, I said I want to have a small range. I just want to produce wines that fit to my soil and wines that fit to my region. And each wine should have another philosophy and another idea. And I decided for myself, each of my wines should get the same passion and time and love in the cellar, like any other. And when you have a huge range and so many different wines, you lose focus and you lose the possibility to give each wine the same attention and the same passion. I think it's the same with cooks in a restaurant. If you have a menu with 100 pages, perhaps you lose focus and you're not having the time and the passion to concentrate on each dish. So when you have a restaurant with a smaller menu, then perhaps you just have a few dishes and you have the time to care about every dish with passion and with love. And so this is also true for wine. And this is the reason why I personally don't produce sparkling. Mm -hmm. um, so now we were talking about the region, about Austria, the grape varieties. Uh, if you want, I can show you some expressions from my winery. And of course it would be much better if if you would be here in Austria with me, then you would see how it looks, but I'll show you. Yes, this is, for example, my village where I come from, a small, 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 small village. And you see it's quite hilly, so Austria is not a flat country. So we have quite steep slopes where we grow the wines. And so our wines always have to suffer and to go for nutrients that are deep down in the soil. Riesling grapes. Riesling. during harvest. So we have to make also checks for ripeness and for the taste. And then during harvest already, here we harvest again, risking really old vines. They are also more than 60 years old. And this is what you also find. It's ladybirds and, you know, when you work with grapes and with wines, you are always in the nature outside. And there's so much life around you. Like you find these small birds, they build their nest in the middle of our wines, in between of our grapes. So to produce wine is not an industrial job. To produce wine is about nature. To produce wine is about to be outside, to produce wine is about listening to the weather, to the climate, to the soil, everything that is around. And I don't know if anybody of you ever was looking at the bottle of my winery. If you turn it, you find on every bottle the vineyard here. And below the hair, it's an Austrian text, unfortunately, it says, our hands are the tool, our soil is the origin. 
So for me, being winemaker is a lot about handwork, about listening, about working with the nature. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I have the hair on each level is, I think, you know, when I work, when I go out to my vineyard to work it, I recognize I'm the owner of the land and I could do with the land whatever I want. But in truth, it's not my land because all these animals, the hares, but also the deer, the ladybirds that you saw, the other birds, everything. These animals live the whole year in my vineyards. And if I go to my vineyard to work, I'm actually an intruder to their home, to their living room. And for me, the hair was always the sign, no matter what I do in my vineyards, no matter how I work my vineyards, um, we always have to focus that it's a habitat and that we have to think what we do with our nature for the animals now, for the people now, but also for upcoming generations. Right. And I told you, um, it's not just for me, what I do outside, it's also for upcoming generation. And winemaking in Austria is usually family businesses. So Austrian wineries are usually small, it's not industrial wineries, so it's real family wineries. And so it's also in my winery, we have 18 hectares, and my granny, she planted most of the vineyards that I had and that I still have. So most of them are 60 years old and older. These are my parents. They also have to work the whole day in my winery because the lowest money, you know. And oh, some impressions of the wine cellar. So this is super traditional single vineyards we ferment in used Austrian barrels and the basic wines we have in small stainless steel tanks. The most important family member, Bruno the mouse keeper. <laughs> so everybody is important at our winery, also the small ones. <laughs> So if you have now, I think we had a quite good overlook over um, Austria. And if you have some questions, it would be time now to ask them via the chat. Ah, Josef is asking, do you have intention to expand with more hectares? No, no intentions. Our company size is beautiful. I can overlook all my vineyards. I can do the cellar alone. I know every vineyard, the whole year, I can overlook it outside. So when I get my grapes home, I know what happened to them in the cellar. I know every barrel. And if I would become bigger, I couldn't overlook it all myself. I would need a cellar master who has to report to me. And then you lose control and you also lose the bond between your vineyards and your wines. So no, we don't want to expand. So Madeleine was also asking a question, do you export your wines? If so, what markets are you pursuing? I export some of my wines because I personally love to see when my wines are in good hands and I love to see if my wines are also drunk somewhere really far away from a super tiny village. So we export a little bit overseas to the United States and to Australia, Japan, Peru. These are the most far away export countries. We produce sweet wines from what? From Well, from from what do they produce with us? Um, yeah, perhaps 
die Mine Uhudler. You know Uhudler, Gregory had the, wanted to write a blog about Uhudler, I guess. Um, it's an American direct crafted gray, but it's super, super, super small. And it's not, how do you say, it's not widespread. I mean, you rarely get it because just a few producers do it. I think uh, Ingrid has uh, has something else to do, so we should let let her go. And uh, thank you so much, Ingrid, for your time uh, today. It really has been a, a a lovely chat with you. Yeah, I'm sorry that my internet connection now is a little bit bad. Um, sometimes I don't know. There are days where I don't know uh, too many people at home already at this time from work. And they are using the <laughs> the internet too much. I don't know. I'm sorry for bad connection, but I hope everybody understood it, and I hope it was interesting for you to learn some more about Austria. And of course, if you have any questions, you can mail me or ask Gregory. He knows everything. I have the feeling about Austria. And of course, if somebody of you ever comes to Austria. You are very welcome to pay me a visit. So, Ingrid, thank you so much. This has been a lovely chat with you, and uh, I'm sure we will have other questions that will come up uh, after people have a chance to think about uh, the chat today. So, if anyone has any questions, please please contact me. You all have my my contact information. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, on behalf of the Peruvian Alliance of Sommeliers, we really thank you so much. Yeah, thank you that so many people took part today. And sometimes I feel we talk too much about wine. And I always recommend the people, please try the wines, taste them, and then you will get the philosophy then you will get what Austria tastes like, what I mean when I'm talking about freshness and acidity. Then you know what I mean when I talk about shiny fruit, things like that. So sometimes this is much more easy than talking too much. So thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Okay. So, so thank you again, Ingrid. Ciao. Auf Wiedersehen. Hasta la vista. <laughs> <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> ciao, ciao.